Good evening. Good evening. Wow, it's great to see you all here on this um, very, very rainy evening. <laughs> Thank you all for braving the weather and coming out to see the art as well as hear a little bit about me. Um, my name is Richland Burnett Ryan. Of course, it's hyphenated because I wanted to highlight my dad in my, you know, future. Um, my wonderful husband right here, Weldon Ryan, who's also an artist, is very instrumental in my art career. So um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in uh, South America, Guyana, uh, Georgetown. Uh, my parents immigrated to the U.S. for better opportunity and left us in Guyana uh, while they pursue um, career options. My father came here to study as a student and my mom followed him to support him. Um, there was five children left in Guyana at the time uh, with my grandmother and one with my great aunt. Um, he was six months, I was about a year and a half at that time. So after growing up in Guyana, the whole family came and settled in Brooklyn, New York. So, I'm sorry, I have to get this. Um, so we settled in Brooklyn, New York, and um, I was educated there. Went to Clara Barton High School. Um, wanted to study fashion design, but um, find that the schools that had that uh, major wasn't very serious with um, the academic, and I was serious about academics. Um, so I transferred to Clara Barton High School, which was the high school for nursing, where I was in the um, Macy's Foundation program, which is equivalent to like IB um, today. And I graduated there and then went off to study graphic design at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, at the same time I was leaving for college, I met Weldon. Just about, I would say, a week before I left to go off to college. My plan was to go off to college and be free and experience life and, you know, do all of that. But I met this amazing guy <laughs> who had the foresight to give me his promotional card with his illustration on it. And do you know what a hook that is? It was a hook. I went out to dinner with my friends and I couldn't stop looking at this piece of artwork. And then we continued to talk to each other over the phone. I think we had maybe one date before I left for school. He will tell you later on about that date. It was an epic date. <laughs> it was an epic date. But anyway, we, we, I went on to college. I studied graphic design at RIT for two years, then uh, got an internship with Eric Maurer and Associates, which I was, I had my career planned out, um, but life had my life, you know, the universe had my life planned out. So meeting Weldon was amazing because I was done with guys, I was just going to be career, and I met the most amazing person in my life, and I was smart enough to recognize that because I could have blown it. But I recognized that he was, very, he was an amazing person, so I, I kept that going. And so after two years of Rochester, I moved back to New York, decided I was gonna come back to the city to live with Weldon, and I started going to SVA, and then life hit me. My brother was taken, my youngest brother, who was very close to me, um, was taken, uh, violently, um, so it shook our entire family, because if you know anyone who's Guyanese, we're engineers, doctors, lawyers, uh, you name it, we're reaching chemists and those sort of things. And my brother was very talented, he was a, uh, mechanically inclined, but he didn't have the focus of where to go because he was the youngest. So he wasn't a bad kid, he was just into music, and that was his focus. And of course, back in the, that time, music was not a safe career option to be in because there was all these elements. So 
it took him somewhere where his, he was taken from us. So it shook the entire family and I decided, I stopped going, I, you know, was, uh, took a pause from school and decided to focus on other things. And I, Weldon started the police and he asked me to marry him, started our family and um, the kids came. So my career was put to the back. Um, after the kids were at a safe age, which for me was five, I figured as, as long as kids can talk, they can go out and they can tell me if anything's happening that I don't agree with. So at five, I started going back into the workforce and I landed a job at um, um, Thompson Financial, which is a huge um, information publishing um, corporation which dealt with a lot of the financial market. And I started as a graphic designer doing news, um, newsletters, which is at the bottom of the level, entry level. And I quickly got a promotion as a art director for one of their publication, one of their oldest publications, um, Investment Dealers Digest. I hope I'm not boring you. So that's a little bit about me. And then after um, doing that, I then, 9-11 happened, we had our 9-11 baby, my husband retired, and we moved to Palm Coast. And that's where the real creativity started because after the kids were grown, we started um, focusing on Weldon's career as an artist, and then I kicked in after my last daughter graduated and started moving on to the secondary education level. So um, I'm gonna tell you, so we started doing art, um, I started really late, uh, 20, 2014, 2017, started experimenting with collage using Oprah magazines uh, to do a couple of pieces. And then I found some tissue that was left after gifting. You know, we always put away things, maybe I'll use it again, maybe not. And so I said, what if, what if I took this tissue and use it as my color medium. And I laid it over some black and white imagery with a, uh, using the collage technique. And I got really good response from the pieces I created. Of course, I had a graphic sense. So creating art was nothing new to me. So when I created the first pieces, and which you will see later on, I usually start with a black and white, which is this piece here then start adding color with the color tissue. And it's progressive and it's really organic. I don't have rhyme or reason. It's what I feel, you know, it's really expressive. And I give myself the permission to make mistakes. Um, and, you know, the piece may go all the way to the, to the end and it may not be successful, but at least I allow myself that space to just create freely because it's important to me to give myself that space. So that's the joy of me creating, not uh, wondering and stressing over the outcome, but just the, the joy of doing it. So that's how I usually do it. And my medium is tissue acrylic, usually use just a regular glue, Elmer's glue. Sometime I adhere the, the tissue to the canvas with just water. And, and it just, it's, it's a very organic flowing process. And then when the tissue dries, you get some incidentals. So that's even amazing within itself. Um, so now I'm gonna show you a little bit of my work. And these are some animals. Now this is a piece which, this was one of my first pieces I did when I started doing art, 2011. Um, I just entered the uh, Flagler County um, Art League's, one of their competition, and this one was called Color Splash. And this is really our dog shaking after a bath. And I saw it in color, so I said, okay, this might be, a, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's animated, and I can actually um, explore color and rip paper and see what I can get with it. And I did this in one night. I started the, the initial drawing and then I just ripped up a whole bunch of Oprah magazines because 
I, uh, my sister-in-law was ordering them and she had duplicates. So she, she gave me all these magazines and I don't like to waste. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna make good of this. And one of the things about Oprah magazine is, of course, Oprah has a lot of money. So the varnish that they put on these pages, they're not going away. The color is brilliant. When you get one of those pages, I don't know about today, but the older issues, top quality printing process. So the colors were vibrant and brilliant and I ripped them up and I created this piece and I actually won an award for this. I think it was first place or best in show. I think this one was best in show, color splash. And this was one of my first entry into the art league. And then I started exploring more with um, the color tissue and this is completely with color tissue and a little bit of acrylic for the line drawing. And you'll see some changes in the work as we go on where it's getting heavier with the blacks. But this one, the underlying drawing is in just color um, acrylic. And this is a play on three cranes. So you have the crane, the mechanic, you have the crane, the bird, and then there's an origami crane in the background. I don't know if you can see it. So. Yeah, and this is also an award-winning piece. Um, and that was 2016. And I did that and this piece at the same time. And you could see the relationship. As I worked in succession with pieces, you'll see that they relate to each other. And then there may be a jump in a little bit of the technique I'm using. So this is, again, color underlay um, with the line work and the dots and then everything else is tissue and then some acrylics. I also played around with a little bit of abstract and this is something I really want to explore but I haven't had the chance because I've been caught up doing figurative work. So most of my work is very um, expressive and this is a piece I'm exploring uh, color and just um, the feel of the rays of the sun being fragmented, perhaps through glass. So it's just called rays. And these are small pieces, 12 by 12. I guess I, at that time, I wasn't brave enough to explore on bigger pieces. And this is Echo. Um, tropical Vibrations. And when I really got it started is when uh, my husband and I opened our own space, our own gallery. And so there was actually room to explore larger pieces and um, just do ex experiments. So these are the florals. Um, so this is water and uh, tissue and experimenting with how the overlays of different colors on top of each other creating uh, contrast and um, it was really really fun exploring this medium and I'm still exploring it um, from day to day I would learn something new about the medium whether it be the glue I'm using the water technique or the the manufacture of the tissue might be a little bit different some of them use wax over the color some of them don't and whether you use the, the front or the back of the tissue give you different, um, different results as well. So this is tulip dance. This is fiery tulips. And these are small works. They're not too big. They're 20 by 16. So this is, uh, this is a piece I went large. I think this was the first large piece this is 36 by 36 um of course as artists you're always thinking oh my gosh that canvas is too expensive i'm not going to do that <laughs> what if i mess up so um i gave myself permission to explore with this um, piece and it's also an award piece award winning piece um, and this is catalea um, 
And some of my work reflects social issues I'm drawn to to comment on, as well as um, support, positive change, and some I am commenting on things I would like to change that I'm not too pleased about. So the social pieces, um, this one um, is personal as well as social because um, I didn't know why seeing a young boy that looks like this would always bring me a sad feeling. And the funny thing was this boy reminded me of my youngest brother. And it, it happened way before his passing that I would just get sad. I mean, like, you look, you look like my brother. I should be happy. But it always brought up a sad feeling in me. And um, so this is kind of like an homage to my brother. It's called Boy. And it's just a sad boy peering through the colors. And the technique I used with the tissue with this one was very free. It was the black image behind, more of a collage technique. And just being free with putting the color over it. There's no attention to um, leaving high uh, black imagery coming through. Everything is covered over with the tissue. And so some of the black or gray coming through is just incidental because the color that's going over the black underlying image is light enough for you to see what's going on underneath. And it was very good. Um, I, I, I was very happy with this, this method. And this continued through these uh, couple of pieces where it's all about the black image, the gray tone image behind and the color just going over it to create that expressive emotional feel. And this is a contemplating poverty, of course, talking about poverty is, and um, children in poverty. Um, I was very poor when I was growing up, but I didn't know it because everyone around me was of the same circumstances. And unless you know what the other folks is doing on the other side, you will not have an idea that you're poor, you know, because you can find joy in that as well. So uh, we had lots of great adventures, um, even though we didn't have a lot. And this is um, speaking to girls and um, sexual abuse and girls issue. Um, here are our prayers. And this is following the same technique, but. With this one, I brought through more of the black and more of the black image uh, through the tissue. So this was kind of moving towards what I'm doing more of today. So, yeah. And this is a this is a scream. This image, this piece, I did because I was actually thinking of what my son was going through. He had attention deficit disorder. Beautiful kid, incredibly brilliant amazing photographer, amazing artist, amazing musician, and yet every, every single teacher or academic um, opportunity was hindered by him not being able to learn how other people, how other students learned. And we got into this whole ADD situation relatively early in how people were dealing with students with ADD. I had to create my own curriculum for him, pull him out of school in New York, brought him down here, still had issues. And I think he taught us more than we taught him because he taught us, both my husband and I, how to fight for him. And it, you know, it made us better people. So this piece is really about him screaming because He's an amazing person, but everyone was focusing on how he wasn't learning the way other students were learning and missing the opportunity to see the beauty in him. So this is a scream. Um, and I sort of pulled in Monk's piece, the scream as well. And you could see that the movement of the paper as well sort of emulates that whole thing as well as the, um, the pose of the, the subject. And um, of course, this is in 2016 after the election. Didn't know what to do after my hopes of a woman president. 
uh, you know, it was so sad. We didn't know what to do. So Weldon, myself, and some other artists decided, you know, the only way to communicate our emotions is to create art. So this is a piece called Not America. And it's subtle. I could have screamed in what I was trying to communicate, but I just decided I would be as subtle with it. And it's just the Statue of Liberty, but the um, inscription on the Statue of Liberty, everything is in the negative, so that it's not America. We don't want your, your, your tired, your, you know, and she lays down her torch at the end of the, uh, the whole um, ins inscription to it. Um, so, um, one thing I do do, even though I'm doing negative pieces or emotional pieces, I, I am creating them with very vibrant colors because I love colors and to me the sunshine and the perspective of being from the Caribbean is always optimistic. So I don't really enjoy just going completely moody and mud, mud colors. That doesn't appeal to me. So even if I'm doing something sad or emotional, it will be with a look to hope with the colors. Um, so I will communicate with some dark, darker tones, but I do like to include um, the bright hues. Um, these three pieces are actually imprints from a wood carving I did um, about slavery. And so it's just um, a imprint and communication about how even though we've gotten out of slavery, there still remains the, the uh, remnants of the systems that came into effect after slavery was abolished to keep people still in, in um, slavery. And it's, um, you know, the prison system, um, just the educational system, and just how we relate to the, to the woman. And you'll see the, uh, the, the sculpture I did after that. And this is Rosa Park. And I'm moving more into a heavy black, um, rendering of the image and then the, the color overlay. So everything in this piece, tissue is over it, creating simultaneous contrast uh, with the tissue going over the black. And this is another um, social piece, it's Angela. And I just saw Angela as an icon, so I wanted to duplicate that by just Creating an icon is something, you know, it's a brand, so I just wanted to do the imagery over and over. And this is one of the pieces where I did the black and white. It was just a line drawing, and of course, Weldon saw the piece and said, you know, uh, I like the line quality. So, of course, myself, I needed to explore the color with the line and perhaps some, some um, solid um, shapes. And so I had to explore it. So that's why I continue to explore the image in smaller um, iconic pieces of Angela. And so this piece, you know, um, it hangs where the black and white piece is behind. It's 48 by 48. And then all the smaller pieces are over it. So the, the idea behind it was as I wanted it to be an interactive piece, so if a person bought a piece, that piece needs to go as it's being bought so that it would reveal the piece behind. And so the piece behind is called I Am, and the little um, pieces in front is called Angela, and those are the 12 by 10s. And um, this piece is My America, and this was done for the Ritz Museum, at the Ritz um, Theater and Museum in Jacksonville. Every year we do a collective project with um, a group of artists, and we're giving a prompter, and there's no, um, no restrictions. Of course, there's probably size restriction, but there's no restrictions. You're free to go and explore your creativity and, com and create something that communicates the prompter. So this one was um, 
uh, 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 through our eyes um, dealing with South Africa, because South Africa, um, Mandela City, Mandela Bay is um, Jacksonville's city, uh, sister city. So there was a exchange between the two artists. So we created art and then after it showed in um, Jacksonville, it would then go over to um, South Africa and uh, be installed in their museum for, for a time being. And this piece went over to, it, of course it was juried in, so it won uh, a chance to go over to South Africa um, just in time for Nelson Mandela's birthday um, celebration. So it was there from 2018 late 2018 to uh, 2001, I believe. It just came back. So this is one of two pieces, and this is um, My America, and this is Nelson Mandela's South Africa. And it just showed the relationship between the struggle for, for human rights between the two countries, um, and even, um, the support of a lot of Americans for South Africa to get its um, equal rights as well. And um, recently, after the immigration crisis at our borders, I felt, uh, let's see, I felt strong enough as a mother that I knew from my mother the sacrifice she had to to put my mother and father to come to this country to make a better life for their children. What a lot of the, the um, immigrants who are coming to our shores are going through and how brutal it was for anyone to separate a mother from her child. And so I felt I had to say something. So I just started doing mother and child pieces. I had no idea they would show or anything. I just said, I, you know, I really need to put this on, on, on the canvas. So I just started doing some mother and child pieces. And you can see there's more heavy in the black. I'm leaving some of the black exposed and the color around it. And I'm still working from black to color with these pieces. And this was in 2020 working on this piece during the pandemic. Um, so I did several pieces, mother and child, just exploring the love of mother and child um, with the work. And this whole series was shown at the Maitland Museum um, in 2020. Um, they had a mother and child exhibit I didn't know they were going to have one, but my work was perfect, so I had an entire room to my, for my pieces to be, you know, exhibit there, and it was really, it was really wonderful to see that. Am I going the right way? My love. Okay, now this year, after everything, I'm still, you know, artists are, you know, of course, we, we feel what's going on in, I'm sorry, we feel what's going on in the community. And most of the time we're trying to make some sense of it and usually it comes out in our work. So this year, I didn't know what to do. I, I said I could um, perhaps scream, do some, you know, what can I do? And I, I've been hearing more and more that love is the only thing that can conquer hate. So I just decided, um, how can I express love in its more stripped down form and listening to my mentor and husband <laughs> he kept saying every time I do a piece and I do the black and white he goes are you not going to put color on that are you so I, I listened a little bit and I decided I'm just going to do a black and white pieces and so this year I did just a series of my love and this is a portrait of Weldon, because I've never done a portrait of him, ever. <laughs> so this is my first portrait of Weldon. I've done the children, but never Weldon. And this is a portrait of um, myself, my oldest daughter, and my son way back when. Um, and these were actually 
sittings we did for Weldon's portraits, but he has never gotten to them, so I took privy and just uh, decided I'm going to take them. So, um, and this is one of him and our daughter. And I started trying to explore with some patternistic backgrounds in the pieces. Uh, if I can't do color, maybe I can do pattern to create some sort of excitement. So um, I am a graphic designer and some of the motif of fashion, um, love fashion as well. So I, I'm exploring with a couple of pieces of using patternistic backgrounds in the piece as well as just using the hard black and white. And these are large pieces. And Dear Land of Diana. <laughs> uh, this year I was asked to do a couple of pieces to enter into a show about Guyana because of the, um, the political turmoil in the country. Um, uh, a gallery in Harlem wanted to do a, a art show for Guyanese artists talking about their experience in Guyana, uh, memories, um, and so I really wanted to explore this because Guyana is dear to me. Um, it's the place I was born, and this is called Lime Street Yardies, and this picture has um, all my cousins uh, from my father's sister, my father's two sisters, so one of them have two children and the other has three children. And then my mother and father has six children in this photo. And we all lived in one little house, except for my youngest brother. He lived with my aunt. So in this tiny little house, all these kids were being raised. And this is also tying into the immigration story of the sacrifice a lot of people in those developing countries have to do in order to come here. It's not an easy decision to come to America. And this is on Starboro Market. This one was colorful because the market is absolutely colorful and busy. If you've ever been there, there's fruits, there's, it's, it's not a sublime place. It's very exciting and, and active and I try to get that through with this piece. And this is a, a painting of my aunt's house. This is where I stayed two years with my youngest brother, my aunt Margaret, and she's in the country. And so the funny thing is my grandmother was, she ate red meat. My aunt was Hindu, so she didn't eat any red meat. So at one point, of, and my grandmother on the other side didn't eat chicken or fish. <laughs> so when I came to the country, there was no meat, there's only fish, and it was just, just a culture shock kind of with, with the cuisine of my aunt, so it was interesting. Um, and I had some wonderful years growing up here with my, my youngest brother. I didn't know him until I came here for two years to, to bond with him, and it was just... Um, amazing years growing up. And so there's a story where as my mom left me and didn't leave me with a doll, so because I was a creative person, one, on our evening walks, my brother and I found this doll head and we took it home. Of course, we hid it from my aunt because she didn't like us picking up things from the ground. So we hid it and we brought it home and we put it together with a Johnson baby powder bottle, split the head and put it on there. And then I used some nails. This is me creating. This is my creative venture. Used some nails to create the arms and the legs and created a doll. And so we kept it secret. She didn't know. And then one day I was, I had the doll and I'm dressing, I made clothes and everything. And a friend of hers came and saw it and was like, oh my God, that's amazing. That's a, that's wonderful. And I got so much um, positive reinforcement from that. I think this is the point where I decided I'm a creator. And I started sewing and I started making things and it just kept going from there. So this is my point of becoming a creator. <laughs> and so these are some of my sculptures. 
This is a plaster sculpture done in a subtractive method, pouring a block of plaster and then carving it down, smoothing it with different grades of sandpaper until you are to the point of the, the, the smoothest grain to get this, this look of it. This is a, another sculpture I did. This was done here in Florida. It's an award winner as well. And this one went to South Africa as well. This was part of three pieces of mine that went to South Africa because this was about rescue. But this piece was really about 9-11, um, Rescue Me. It was for a 9-11 art show. And Walls is a concept I created uh, for Jacksonville as well. Um, just uh, trying to talk about, trying to uh, communicate what walls have been put in place to stop f people from um, attaining power, wealth, and just basic human rights. So um, this is a piece done with wood um, and nails. This is roofing nails, um, and it's supposed to illustrate the prison uh, system, which is a new slavery, because a lot of people in the prison system, and if you know the 13th, once you're in, you lose your rights. Um, and so there's also uh, a lot of people are doing labor for unbelievable uh, corporations are exploiting the prison system to, um, to gain workers as well. And um, so that was one of the pieces. It's, it's a three piece um, illustrating the walls of um, slavery. So that was the new slavery pieces. I should have done it differently. And this is a wooden sculpture. It's a three tier in a triangular formation depicting uh, the stolen heritage, which is in the slavery system, the one thing they took away from the man was his heart. Um, and that was most of the, the torture and the degradation was done to dehumanize the male figure in the family unit. And so this, was, uh, this sculpture, it depicts the family unit and the destruction that slavery was aimed at uh, within the family unit. Um, so this is the male figure, um, and it's the wood carving, and then burnt and fire um, applied to the, the hole to create the burnt through the soul. And this is, this is where that scream rubbing is also going back to Monk's piece, and the first piece I did, I thought, what would a child going through slavery what would be going through that child's mind? It's insanity. So I thought the only thing would be a scream to the future and, um, and I branded slave on the child's forehead because in the system, the child was being educated to be a slave in this system. He wasn't educated to do anything else but to become a slave, so that was the piece. That's all one piece. It hinges, yeah, it hinges into a triangular formation. And it's freestanding. It stands on its own. Um, yeah. And so this is the woman, the rape of our wealth. And, of course, this is, the text here is just telling you what a child born in slavery was equivalent to and what that child would be equivalent in 20... 2009. So um, it was the raping of our wealth. And of course, none of the figures are, on, are grounded. They're sort of, because it was an, this whole system was not meant to ground us. It was meant to keep us, you know, off grounded. So the woman's on her knees, the man is without feet because he's not grounded. And I purposely put them above the ground because it's not supposed to be that they're grounded in this system. <coughs> and then this piece is a mixed medium piece um, relating to um, 
the Jim Crow period. And of course, I don't know if you could see it very well, but it's white ropes hanging and then a weaving of um, sort of a tree without leaves because under the system, no matter what roots we were planting as African Americans in this country, it, it may get to a point, but then it was also, you know, outed. Whatever progress was made was not meant to grow and bear fruit and become viable. It was then, you know, cut off through the system of white supremacy. So this is um, planting roots on the white supremacy. And as I was weaving, the piece was becoming, of, it, it was the tension of weaving pulled the wood in tight. And I thought maybe I should loose it out and do it again. But then I said, you know, this is a very ten, highly tensioned period. So I'm just going to leave it. Because part of my work is being comfortable to leave it, even though there's a mistake or something goes wrong. It's just what I like to do is just leave it. and some cityscapes. So these are two um, depiction of the Brooklyn Bridge. When I did it, I didn't really realize what I was doing, but one piece after I finished looking at it, it was actually what was happening when, I, when the Twin Tower fell and the Brooklyn, going over the Brooklyn Bridge to escape. I was down there when the first one fell running towards the Brooklyn Bridge. This is basically what the Brooklyn Bridge looked like from the Manhattan side. It was just black and white. And then as, as I made it to the Brooklyn side, as the smoke cleared and the second tower came down and I'm making it through the, the center of a, the bridge, the sun was out. It was a beautiful day and I was making it safely to Brooklyn. So this is. And then another project I did was the Keisha project. Um, the name Keisha is an American made up African American name. And the question was, who is Keisha? And so I found that uh, Keisha is a is a reclaiming name. It's a name that we decided we're going to name ourselves outside of the names that were given to us. So Keisha to me is a power name. So I saw my Keisha as myself and some of uh, the artists that I've come across um, doing curating. So some of the artists on this and some people may know some of them. Alice Walker was, a, was sort of the elder in our community of artists, and she passed away, and she was an amazing artist, um, sort of an outside artist, you would say, because yeah. she was very, I mean, some of her work was classic art, but some of it was very outside, and she was always experimenting with different mediums, and she was awesome. She, was, she, was, she made it close, she almost made it to 90. She was just approaching her 90th birthday before yeah. she, she passed away. So I was just giving, and I did this before she passed away. And I was looking around for her to say, Alice, look, I did a piece with you. And I never got to show her the piece she passed away before. And you know, I put her on the top because I was giving her her dues as the elder with all these female artists. And I was paying homage to all the female artists I've come across. So there's Joyce Hayes is there. Um, 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 Marsha Hatchett, Jacksonville, Joyce Hayes, Orlando, um, and a couple of artists are on there, and my old brain is having brain fogs. <laughs> Doreen Hardy, which is a dear, dear friend of mine, she's a, um, uh, um, uh, uh, <laughs> she's a, um, landscape artists, um, so she's, she's really dear to my heart. And um, so I'm just paying homage with this piece, and these are my quiches. Um, and then, of course, a portrait of uh, Reva Ryan, who's a law student, and she's um, always 
trying to find ways to support the community with her, her skills. And so this is her piece, Justice. And of course, my strong-minded child, I, uh, Savannah, who is a coder and artist. Um, and she has an awesome personality, and I hope you can see it through this piece. And some of her artwork is also on the side of this painting, so it was um, definitely paying homage to her. And of course, this is something I did this year. Um, and it's a self-portrait, but it's also because I'm alive. <laughs> After 2020, anyone who's still here should live life like there's no tomorrow. And I was just enjoying, you know, my afro, my hair was doing great that day. <laughs> and I was just having a great time and Weldon snapped some photos and I, I love it. I love this piece. So I had to, um, I had to do this and this is just a self portrait and this is cool vibration. A photo I wanted to do a piece with. I did a black and white and I, I wanted color in it and I did another color piece of it. So. And this piece is ice cream dream. And now the technique I did with this one, this one was a little bit of an experiment because all the tissue was adhered with water. I decided I was not going to use glue. So the application, the underwork is done, I believe, with color and some, and actually I did black and white on this, black, black um, acrylic paint. And then I, I adhere the tissue to it um, just with water and then I let it dry. And then I came back and did the, um, the gloss medium to seal it. And of course, when you let it dry, the tissue comes back to more of the saturated color. If you adhere uh, the gloss medium to it before it dries, something else happens with the, the dyes in the tissue. So this was an experiment. And actually, I love what the tissue did with the blacks because you get more of an opaque, because the tissue dried, there's more op op opaque um, color from the tissue as opposed to the translucent um, when I sealed it. So this was a good experiment. Um, and I'm continuously learning from the medium, so who knows where it's gonna take me. And this was this year, I mean 2020, after COVID, the whole, of course, I celebrated my Afro and being alive. I also wanted to celebrate the body because a lot of us were just transitioning from the flesh to the spirit. And so I just wanted to say to myself, you know, all the little hangups we have about our body, you better enjoy it while you're here because when you're gone, you're going to wish you had that fat body, that whatever imperfect body so this is just a celebration of the body and so I did a whole bunch of nudes because I never did nudes well I did one nude before but this is just me doing them on a larger scale and they're they're pretty big and pretty bold so I I really was trying to put it out there and this is a diptych and of course, these are the pieces that are represented in this collection I uh, curated for this um, event. And it's, uh, some of the people are, very, are important people, famous, and some are uh, people I personally know, but all of them are very um, important to me. I admire them because of their, what they contribute to this world and how they influence my life as a human being. So it may be music, art, uh, or just knowing them, so. And of course, I love Nina Simone. <laughs> and of course, I had to do her twice because uh, Nina had two, sort of like two lives. Miles. 
and after, of course, 2020. I have a series of Good Trouble I'm doing, and they're basically black and white protest piece. Not ready to show them yet, so um, the closest I've come to showing is this portrait of John Lewis because, of course, he's no longer with us, and I am, you know, proud to have at least pay homage to him in a portrait. And of course, this is the black and white Jimmy that I was told not to put color on. <laughs> you don't know how I, it was, it was torturous. I mean, every day I saw this black and white, I'm like, I want to put color on it. And I had to do a two, a number two, I had to do. So this is the color Jimmy. And Jimmy's no longer with us because he's sold. <laughs> Someone love it enough to take it home. So I'm, I'm very, so I think putting the color on him was, it was great. Because <laughs> Jimmy's music is color and I couldn't do him in black and white because Jimmy's music is color. And I, yeah, so I had to put color on Jimmy. And of course, since I had all those Oprah magazines, had to use it. <laughs> All the O's, and those are some of her quotes from her magazine. Just, you know, had to use it. And of course, this is India Ari. Love her music. She is so soulful and spiritual. Very, very uh, calming presence. So I really love her music. Yeah. And of course, this is my favorite, 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 is Aretha. Um, and of course, this is not a big piece, but I have to do a big Aretha. I'm not really ready to do it, but I really would like to um, pay some attention to that. And this is um, Sister Rosetta. And she's, I don't know if a lot of people know her, but I was asked to, um, do a piece for a, a art show in 2021 um, when everything was starting to open up in New York. And um, it was about her. Um, Six Summit Gallery uh, was doing a music theme and um, I did a little research on her. She's the mother of rock and roll. Without her, you would not. Lots of people have emulated her work and she is not well known enough she's not she's known but she's not known enough and her name should be screened from every and being women's month you know um i'm proud to have done this piece and i think it came out well um so this was in new york for a while and of course these are people that i um i'm very touched by what they did on this planet. So even though, you know, Nipsey had humble beginnings, um, he was always a person who was striving to do better. I mean, not all the methods were probably things you would do, but it was always a means to get out of poverty and do better for himself. And so when he became famous, he went back to the, his neighborhood uh, brought businesses back to his neighborhood, reached back to kids, um, realizing that there was something lacking in his community that forced him to find other means of uh, hustling and creating a job for himself, which was very creative. But he went back to his community and created a cyber cafe for kids who wanted a code and created a t-shirt business right in his hood. So unlike other people who got rich and famous and left and forgot where they came from, he went back to the neighborhood, created uh, businesses, but of course that's being around the element that's not so safe could also cost you your life. And um, it kind of connects with me and my brother. So um, this is why I find what he was doing was um, amazing. And this is like the only famous person from where I grew up in Pleasant, Skyhanna, Eddie Grant. <laughs> he is like, he's the, I mean, the Trinidadian over here has many, many artists. Um, Guyanese people only have, we have a couple, but you know, a couple are coming up now, but Eddie Grant is by far the most famous person from Guyana. And he's from my mother's 
small little village where I spent two years in Pleasance, and so Eddie Grant is big for me. And this was part of the Guyanese um, art exhibit that's still coming. It's not done yet. And this is Bob. This is my first Bob. And um, he's out in California now. He's not here with us. So he's been, you know, someone's home in California. And this is the second Bob I did. I had to do him again. Um, and so he's here with us. And this was also from Jimmy. I started using the tissue in a different method, which is just randomly with random shapes, um, filling up the, the white area um, of the, um, the drawing, the first layer of black and white paint on the canvas. And I'm enjoying it. But then this one, I decided to flip it. Um, this is Calypso Rose. Um, we met her. She's approaching 90, full of spirit. Um, everyone who's Caribbean knows Calypso Rose. She is the queen of Calypso. She's actually, this is Women's Month, and this woman had ovaries. She was the only one, you know, doing Calypso in a lot of the male bands. And of course, back then, it wasn't like, I, it wasn't considered proper for women to be doing this work. Um, so she broke a lot of barriers doing Calypso at that time. And so Weldon met her, she sung a little song to him. And her spirit is, she has more life than I do. The way she lives, it, that smile on her face is genuine. It just comes through her. So this piece, instead of doing the black drawing first, I did the color. I applied the color to the entire canvas, and then I went in with the black and white. So this was the reverse um, technique I was using with it. And of course, this is Billy. And the last piece in this is Diana. And so after doing all that work in 2020 and 2021, I decided to give myself a little bit more work and challenge. I decided I'm going to do a 100 square project, 100 um, paintings on 6 by 6 canvases. And this was an effort to inspire people to collect my work because um, one of the things is, because I'm working so big, the price value was um, a little bit out of some people's reach. And my goal was always not to lower the price of something that I really worked hard on and it has value, but to allow to do work so that people who are um, thinking and wanting to collect the work could afford. So these little pieces was um, sort of to encourage initial collectors. And so I said to myself, you know, I could do a hundred pieces. It's small. It's less work. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not less work. It's actually taking me longer to do one of these pieces than perhaps a larger piece because the freedom how I move on the piece is constricted to doing these tiny little stroke and you have to figure a big piece of tissue over the piece will just be done and the nuances will never be captured unless you're using little tiny pieces so most of these are done with just acrylic and black black and um, color acrylic some of them I'm using tissue in some places but it's all it's all fun, it's experimental, and some of these pieces I will do big. Um, some of them I've, I've already done big, and some of them are just studies of pieces of paintings I've done. So, um, oh, and I'm also offering, I'm old, I'm old. So, you know, I've always tried to keep ahead of the curve trying to do things that are, you know, innovation. And so this NFT world 
intrigues me. So I have a mentor of ours um, who is venturing into that. And I was always, I'm act I was actually trying to encourage our kids to get into NFT and none of them were budging. You know, um, non-fungible tokens. And these are digital artwork um, with smart contracts um, that um, are offered on in the cyber world with cyber with cryptocurrency. Um, there's a whole bunch of things you have to go through in order to purchase one. Yeah, but it's it's it's. I have to tell you, it is here. It will be here, and it's not going away. So most of the major galleries are have already gotten into NFTs. So if, if everyone's telling you it's it's a fad, it's not because a lot of the cryptocurrency millionaires need to spend their money on things they can buy with cryptocurrency. I mean, they can transfer it into dollars, but dollars are, we are going to the next step. And every single major gallery has a NFT collection, have NFT artists or are offering analog art as NFT. So they're just creating a, a, a smart contract, offering a digital picture and the original art together. So that's what I'm doing, is minting them, offering the NFT version, which is just a digital representation, um, and the original art together. So forever, if I offer one of these pieces of, as an NFT, in order to transfer it, you have to transfer both of them together to the, to the next collector, to the next buyer. And those digital sales, every time it transfer from one hand to the next, there's a record of it. So a lot of artists would sell their work and that's the end of it. You don't know where it's forever. With an NFT, you know where your work is, how many times it's been sold, who it's going to, and if it stops being sold and it's in a private collection, that's the end of it. Um, also, in the smart contract, there's residuals. So you get a percentage of each sale. So it's really... So it just kind of transfers to the each unit of royalties. Yes, and it's how you make your contract. You can say 10%, 5%, 2%, 3%, 1%. It's how you write the contract. Excuse me? It's forever, as long as it's been transferred to another buyer and as, and as the value of the NFT goes up, of course, percentage of that value sale goes to you because whatever percentage you wrote in the contract, that's what you would get. I don't know, things may change, you know how things go, but that's how it is. And that's pretty much it. Um, Um, and we have a, some time for questions. Yes. Have I don't even think I put a name on it. Oh, That's the crazy you? thing. I don't remember a name, but um, I had a lot of fun playing with it. Um, and so did my brother. And I became a sewer because of the doll. I started sewing with needle and thread because my aunt of course, she used to sew all my clothes. So I learned from her, you know, her scraps I used to take and go and sew doll clothes. And so. I was always into my dolls, and I sewed for them too. And mm -hmm. they were, I was not only silent, but they were very important. They were my best. Yeah, and the funny thing is, I did have dolls when I lived with my grandmother, but my mom thought it was a good thing not to tell me what was happening because she didn't want to deal with the drama. So she left me there. I had no idea I was going to be left there. And it was, I told her later on in life that I was the most, it was, um, what do you call it? Um, it was traumatic to me. Devastating. It was devastating. Yes, it was really. And I, I had to tell her that that was one of the most traumatic things in my life to that point. I've never had anything traumatic. I was mourning for days for my brothers and sisters because I grew up with them. And that's who I knew as my,
protectors and my, my, my friends and everything. And so then not to leave me with a doll, <laughs> I, you know, so. And, and my aunt, I knew if that woman didn't see that doll and, and complimented me about that doll, if my aunt saw that doll, it would be in the, it would be in the trash. So that was positive. Anything else? Oh, no, it's not Ghanaian, um, it's Guyana. Guyana yeah, it's, um, Guyana is in South America, and it's the only English-speaking country on the continent. Oh. So it's, it's, it was a British colony, so you have French Guyana, Dutch Guyana, British Guyana, and that's where I'm from. Yeah, and, one other question, uh, approximately how old uh, were you when you knew you were an artist when you wrote a paint? Paint? Oh, I, I forgot one story. Um, when I came to this country, of course, I always sewed clothes for my dolls, created, draw. But what I used to do was take um, composition notebooks, rip out the pages, take the um, hard surface, and create little houses out of it. Mm -hmm. And I used to draw wallpaper, put the furniture in, put people in really great pieces and an aunt of mine who was teaching at um, Penn State, she was an artist. She saw the work and she says, and she um, exhibited it at some art show. Of course, I never got to see it, but it was there. So that was another reinforcement for me that art is valued. And so with the doll and then someone appreciating me doing the crazy thing I was doing with the notebooks, Everyone thought it was crazy, but I was doing it because it was interesting to me. She appreciated it and um, exhibited it. So I didn't get photos, I didn't get anything, so yeah. But that was about maybe 12. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Well, because I do a lot of digital work, okay. so I would just um, digitally take out all the black, take out the, all the... Sort of design it on the computer. Yeah. Right, so I would take out all the gray tones. I would, first of all, make it a black and white, take out all of the gray tones, and just, I play with the, 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 the um, tonality, you know, the contrast and to the point that I like, and that's what I then use to, to transfer it to the canvas. Okay. And then you'd actually acrylic to paint it? Yes, to paint it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. yeah. And then there's the color and yeah. experimenting with it, so, yes. And manipulating it, uh huh, mm -hmm. and it could be before the computer. One of the things I used to do is take things and photocopy it, and then cut it out, and then transfer it to in a collage method to the canvas or the board or whatever, and then work from there. Before that, I used to I, I used to do this before. I think. I was destined to do this, this kind of work because back in college, I used to photocopy onto transparency um, and then lay that over color swaps, color blocks, and then color copy that. That's before the computer, <laughs> before everybody had a computer, and then color copy that and print it. And so that's how I was getting finished pieces of work. I would even um, photocopy things like spoons and stuff on the photocopier, print it out, cut it out, manipulating the, um, the image that way. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. Okay, I've got a question. On the Statue of Liberty, uh, can you tell me what the poem was about behind the commentary on it? Okay. 
So everything that the, you know, give us your poor, your tired, your hungry, it says do not. Um, everything was in the negative. Basically what we were saying to immigrants that were coming to our shores, do not come. And of course at the end where she holds her torch in, in, the, uh, in the bay, you know, she lowers her torch. Yeah, and it would be cool to perhaps illustrate it if I was, if I was an illustrator, but I, the piece also has hope because it's just talking about what we are at the moment. I don't believe we were gonna end up being that forever. So like I said, all my pieces, I really wanna leave hope. Even if it's something that's so bad, I really wanna leave hope. Because I'm- <laughs> in my sleep, I mean, I do pens, you know, I type out some of my concepts, you know, that later on, because if you think of something and you don't act on it, it goes. And as, you know, we're getting older, the brain is full of a lot of information. I can't even retrieve it from day to day. So penning a lot of stuff, anything that comes up, I type it out. I have a lot of stuff that I want to do that who knows when I would get to do it, but. You, you know, I've got a piece I'm working on now. It's called uh, Interview with the Flag. And I want to ask the flag to represent uh, pretty much the United States, you know, why certain things happen and why this has happened, why the United States is the way it is or whatever. But it's like an interview with the flag as questions and flags are being asked. So oh. That's something I'm working on. Oh, that's cool. So are you going to put the text on the flag answering back? Are you? Yeah. Oh, cool. Nice, yeah. nice, nice. Well, it's, it's create, being creative is good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. The, uh, the, the joy and the insight. I'm sure we'll all be... It'll be resonating for days.